Well, good morning, everybody. I hope that you're taking in all this information. And um, yeah, I'm the education program manager for the Old Man Watershed Council. And I'm going to share how we're using the cabin program to monitor some of our stewardship activities. And then I'll talk a little bit about a broader collaborative that we are part of that across the entire eastern slopes of the Rockies and how we're supporting all these different groups are supporting each other to develop their own monitoring programs. So first, I just want to share a little bit about our organization. The Old Man Watershed Council is a stakeholder led nonprofit or a registered charity based in Lethbridge. And we are one of 11 watershed planning and advisory councils that were formed under Alberta's Water for Life strategy. Our board of directors includes representatives from various sectors, including industry, uh, which currently is represented by Arrow from Spray Lake Sawmills, who I think is maybe on the call, I hope. Hello, if you are. Um, and we all, all of us, everybody who's here, uh, works and lives and plays in a watershed. And so just to make things a little bit interactive, I'd like to invite you right now to type the name in the chat of the watershed that you are in. And if you're not sure, Terry is going to share a link where to a website where you can find what watershed you're in. And if you want bonus points, <laughs> um, if you're able to name the, your local WPAC, the Watershed Planning and Advisory Council, that's even better. So I don't know if I can see everybody's, what they're typing in the chat, but I'll just assume that you're all experts and know what watershed you're in. Um, so the Old Man Watershed, oh yeah, I'm seeing a few, a few people. Uh, the Old Man Watershed is in Southwestern Alberta and it stretches from High River along the Eastern slopes of the Rockies to just east of Tabor where the Old Man and the Bow converge to form the South Saskatchewan. And really we're, we're a headwaters basin. So there's, there is no upstream of us. We are the beginning. And so I feel with that comes a, a responsibility to all the watersheds and communities that are downstream of us to do our best to take care of our land and our water and send a good message downstream through our, our water that's flowing to Saskatchewan and making its way to the Hudson Bay. So because everything all begins in our headwaters, where the river starts, the birthplace of our river, uh, we have been working over the last few years together with volunteers and partners, such as Spray Lake Sawmills, Cows and Fish, Trout Unlimited, and local recreation groups to restore some stream banks in our headwaters. And we do this by planting willow stakes. And uh, you can see here pictured, we have a couple of different sites where we've done volunteer events. It generally happens in the fall, which is when the willows are dormant. And so sometimes we end up planting in the snow, <laughs> which, but usually it's a sunny day anyways. Um, the picture on the left is actually a site along South Racehorse Creek, where there was a road that was decommissioned by Spray Lake Sawmills. And so we just came in to plant some willows to help restore the rice, uh, riparian area along there. And then on the right-hand side, we are also cheerfully relieved and happy to have finished our planting day. And uh, these are staff and volunteers from various organizations along Pask Creek, which is a tributary to the Old Man. And it's right um, next to a bridge, I believe that was also installed by Spray Lake Sawmills. So we've got some good partnerships there. And so these, Willow planting events are grant funded and they rely on these partnerships as well as volunteers. So we've had people, we've had college students come out, people who like to camp and quad in these areas, even a local scout group has come out and helped us to plant willows. And we feel that that's really important to get the community involved and engaged. And um, so you can see we've got sites that we've done. We try to do one every year. We've got on Dome Creek, top left, at that, that South Racehorse Creek picture in the middle. The bottom left is at Caesars Flats along Dutch Creek. And the picture on the right is uh, next to a bridge also in Dutch Creek, a little further upstream. And um, 
a lot of our grants are actually uh, d designated for protecting or improving habitat for aquatic species at risk, like West Slope cutthroat trout. So part of our work is that we want to improve the habitat, but then we also want to demonstrate that we are actually having an impact. So our partners, cows and fish, do riparian assessments of these riparian restoration sites, but we were missing the aquatic component. Are we actually having, making a difference in the water where the fish live? So that brought us to this program. Now, I do not have any kind of background in aquatic ecology. I will admit uh, my master's research was on a semi-arid rangeland, very far removed from water. But I did hear about the cabin program from other WPAC educators. And so when we started thinking about wanting to do some aquatic monitoring, this seemed a logical place or program to use. And, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, the COVID pandemic hit last summer. My summer plans changed dramatically, but it did give me time to actually organize, get all the supplies, get some staff trained, and start doing some of this aquatic monitoring. So we managed to collect sites, uh, samples at seven sites last fall. And these are all sites where we've done some stream bank restoration. And we were able to collect, you know, the benthic samples and the water chemistry samples at these sites. And they're serving as our baseline against which we will hopefully be able to measure some change over time as those riparian plants grow and that habitat is restored. And these are meant then to complement those riparian assessments that cows and fish has been doing. And we're hoping again that you know once we get a reference model through the eastern slopes, we might be able to use that reference condition approach to hopefully see these sites move closer to reference condition. Uh, and just to point out that picture on the right is at South Racehorse, so that site that was um, that reclaimed road. So here we have a few photos of our last year's field season. Uh, top left is on Allison Creek, where we were actually doing some training. Got some fun invertebrates in a jar. Um, definitely, we're very conscious of not spreading any kinds of pathogens or whirling disease. So we want to decontaminate uh, in between our sites. So that's what Pally in the top right-hand corner is doing along Dutch Creek there. Um, <laughs> Pally is actually a chartered accountant and our office manager, but she um, gamely comes along and, and does the field work with us as well, for which I'm very grateful. We've also sampled along Beaver Creek and uh, bottom right there is Pask Creek. And occasionally, um, as with any field work, sometimes unexpected things happen, like a rainstorm when you weren't expecting one or and didn't bring any rain gear. So <laughs> the middle bottom picture is me standing hip, width, hip deep, I guess, in a, a nice, quiet, gentle Dutch creek that's normally about knee deep, but it was raining and we didn't even have rain gear with us, which is not a good idea, so lesson learned. So we improvised with garbage bags and and I had happened to pick up some hard testing gloves from the veterinarian the day before, so those came in handy for keeping our arms dry when we we're measuring puddles. Um, so it's always interesting when you're out in the field and you improvise and get the work done anyways. But that, that creek along Dutch Creek, that rain event, um, was interesting and we can see it in some of our results, which is coming up next. Now we're still waiting on our results from the taxonomist and we also sent samples to the University of Guelph for DNA analysis for metabarcoding. But in the meantime, we can still characterize the water chemistry and some of the habitat data that we collected and we can compare that to Alberta's surface water quality guidelines for the protection of freshwater aquatic life. And so you can see here a few different graphs that I've pulled together are looking at our average depth and velocity of our streams. Typically, these are small headwater streams. They're not very deep. They're not very fast. 
except for the one in the middle, you can see is the anomaly because of that rain event. So normally we would probably not include the data from this site because it wasn't a typical um, day. But we only had seven sites, so I wanted to include it here. On the right hand side, you can see the guideline, the recommended pH levels in the green bar, and all of our sites fell within that. So that's nice to see. The bottom left, you can see the composition of the substrate by size from bedrock at the bottom to silt and clay. So it gets kind of from coarse to fine, bottom to top. And again, that site with the rain event, you can see there's a lot more of the gravel at that site. Part of that probably because there was you know, fast moving water able to bring in some gravel, but also uh, we were a bit limited in which areas we were able to sample for that site. So it's really important, I guess, to be conscious of what could be causing some of these differences and whether it's actually a typical sampling that you are doing, in which case, in our case, it wasn't. And the same thing with the dissolved oxygen on the bottom right. Um, luckily, all the samples were above the minimum levels for, you know, short-term exposure, long-term exposure. Um, one site was a little bit below the ideal for early life stages, but um, above the other levels. And our site, again, at Dutch Creek with the rain event, had very high dissolved oxygen, which I guess is, would be expected. So looking ahead, we're hoping for this coming summer, obviously depending on how things go, to hire some seasonal staff and sample, continue sampling sites where we are doing restoration. And also if funding and resources allow, and also some sites where beneficial management practices are being implemented, uh, such as fencing off riparian areas to keep livestock out or, um, putting in an off-site or an off-stream waterer so that cattle and livestock aren't going down to the water and sleeping in the water, trampling the vegetation. Um, but that, again, will depend on funding and resources. So that's just a little bit about how we have used Habin in the, the limited time that we've been doing this. But um, we've also, another thing that the change of schedule allowed us to do last year was to start having some meetings, some conference calls with different individuals from different organizations across the Eastern Slopes. And so these have included watershed planning and advisory councils, First Nations groups, local watershed stewardship groups, government agencies, many of whom are presenting today, and researchers. And Every time we plan a new meeting, there seems to be more people invited and interested, which is wonderful because we've been able to, pardon me, share resources, you know, share our experience and knowledge because some of us are coming into this brand new. Some people have been doing it for years. So we've been able to support each other in building capacity, advising on, you know, the logistics of planning our studies and sourcing the equipment and maybe applying for funding together. And ultimately, we're hoping, too, that we're going to be able to get a reference model created for the eastern slopes of Alberta. Now, there are obviously, you know, governments are doing monitoring and there are different companies and academic um, organizations that are doing research and monitoring. So what would be the benefit of having these local community groups doing monitoring in addition to or to complement this work? Well, first of all, it does complement and maybe fill in some of the gaps of government or academic research and monitoring. It's community driven, driven by local community needs and values. And because they're coordinated by smaller organizations, they tend to be a little bit more nimble and flexible. You're able to um, they don't have quite so much red tape, perhaps, as some of the larger government bodies might be faced with. And also kind of connected to that is that the local groups are collecting the data, they own the data, and they're able to make that data accessible to the community in a more timely fashion than perhaps 
some of these larger groups might not be able to do. It's also a really fantastic experiential learning opportunity, and it, it um, provides skills training to these organizations and to citizens who are involved as volunteers. And so it provides an opportunity to engage and motivate local citizens. And as kind of grassroots organizations, we really, really love to see local citizens motivated and involved in taking action and feeling like they're contributing to the stewardship of their watersheds. So I think that community-based monitoring is a really nice um, addition to the kind of formal monitoring that's happening elsewhere. And why should we use cabin for this? Well, <laughs> I think that's been covered earlier by Emily and by Shelley, but um, the nice thing with cabin is that, you know, rather than just measuring environmental parameters like stream flow and water chemistry, it's biological monitoring of cumulative effects, both what's happening upstream and upland. And with, you know, 18 plus organizations involved in this collaborative, there's no need for each of us to try to start from scratch and reinvent the wheel. There's already an established process and a network, um, which, like I said, Emily and Shelley both talked about in detail. You know, there's this standardized national protocol. They have field sheets already developed, online databases with analysis tools and training as well as support for staff and volunteers. So that's really, really attractive to us small groups. It's also relatively cost-effective. The field work can be done with pretty inexpensive equipment. And, um, and then having this kind of reference condition approach will allow us to answer key questions. Now, we don't have a model developed for the Eastern Slopes yet, but we're hoping that that will happen sometime in the not too distant future. So some of these key questions, again, because we're small local groups, we can you know, look at local questions that are in, of interest to our individual groups. Some of these things include looking at the impacts of anthropogenic land uses on water quality and watershed health, um, like OWC is doing, monitoring hopefully improvements after our restoration activities and beneficial management practices that we've supported, um, looking at cold water fish habitat and any issues they might have with sediment, wildfire impacts, cumulative effects, and filling knowledge gaps about source water quality and aquatic ecosystem health to inform watershed planning. And so currently as a collaborative, we are having these conference call meetings. Our next one is happening on Friday, actually. We, we met, we're meeting a few times a year. Our previous one was I think in November. And so we're just touching base, keeping each other updated on everything that's going on. If we're finding you know, new sources of funding that we can apply to or getting updates from you know, Emily and, and uh, folks about what's happening with training and all of that. We were fortunate enough to have host a cabin and a stream training uh, last fall here in the Christmas Pass. Now stream also uses cabin protocols. It's a, sequencing the rivers for environmental assessment and monitoring. So it's a pilot project that's using DNA metabar coding in partnership with the University of Guelph. So we're contributing same protocol. We're just sending some samples there for DNA metabar coding and then sending some samples to taxonomists. Um, we're hoping that we'll be able to host some training events some just for our local groups, maybe in Alberta this summer. Again, it all depends on the COVID situation, seeking funding, putting together equipment kits for different groups that need them, that want to start sampling, you know, identifying study questions and sampling sites, and continuing to network and make connections with funders and partners and people that can support our work. Uh, a few of our groups, as I mentioned, were able to start sampling last year. OWC was one, the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society was able to start sampling last summer, well, they sampled a few the year before as well. And FRI, I believe, collected a few samples last year as well. So we're just hoping to build on some of that. You know, we started working some of the kinks out in terms of field work. We know to bring rain gear every time now. And uh, we're hoping that 
we've gotten you know more efficient in, at the process and so we'll be able to build on that for future years and um, before I finish I do just want to acknowledge some of the different groups and funders and organizations that have either expressed support for our aquatic monitoring program or have actually funded our, our work. And these include Spray Lake Sawmills, so shout out to Errol and Matt, the Shell Foothills Legacy Fund, the Alberta Conservation Association's Conservation Community and Education Grant, and um, Living Lakes Canada with through Alberta Eco Trust, and the Government of Alberta, uh, some grants we've received from them. And I also wanted to give a special shout out to Shannon, our executive director of Old Man Monica Council, and Callie, who I mentioned before, who is our office manager and a chartered accountant who never really expected to be out looking for bugs in the rivers and the mountains, but both of them <laughs> have willingly expanded their job descriptions to gamely traipse out into the field with me. So to them and to all of everybody in our collaborative and, and our funders, I want to send a heartfelt thank you. And for all of you who are attending this webinar right now, feel free to contact me with any questions that you may have about our project. I've listed our website here. Uh, we do not have any information about our cabin sampling on our website yet, but hopefully we'll find some time in the summer to update that, um, but yes. Feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions or you want to contribute to any of our work. And uh, yeah, watch this space, I guess. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>